Morning, everybody. Happy hump day. Welcome to the news agenda with me, Fleet Street Fox. And today I'm joined by the Mirror's assistant editor, Jason Beatty. Morning, Jason. Morning, Susie. How are you? Fine, thank you very much. Now, this is the People's Paper Review, so get into the comments, ask us your questions, take part. Uh, those of you listening later on podcast, just going to have to wait to see uh, if you get any kind of compensation for it. Now, what have we got for you today? Well, the mirror has splashed on the shocking death of pensioner Jeff Kitchen at 30,000 feet as his plane hit some unexpected turbulence on a retirement trip of a lifetime to the Far East. Uh, there's more on that in the paper if you're interested in it. But first, I want to take us to pages six and seven, where day two of the week's big story, the infected blood scandal, uh, it focuses on the compensation package, which was unveiled by the government yesterday. Now, this was the day one on Monday. It was the result of the inquiry, which was that it was a devastating all-encompassing national scandal that had lasted for decades. Day two was what the government's going to do about it. And the government's trumpeted uh, that this compensation deal is going to be worth up to £2.7 million ahead. Now, Jason, that sounds too good to be true, really, is it? Probably, yeah. <laughs> I mean, of the victims of this injustice, some, very few, may get that maximum amount oh. um, of... 2.73 million. Um, probably most won't. Um, it's slightly complicated here, Susie, because I mean, the first bit is, um, you know, the, the chair of the infected blood, Sir Brian Langstaff, he first called last April for compensation to be paid immediately. The, the money will not arrive now until probably towards the end of this year, the earliest. Mm. Um, and as we know, there are around more or less four people a week dying as a result of the infected blood, the contaminated blood. So there's, there's the, the difficulty of is like, will they get the money and in, in time? And then there's the question, which is unresolved and there's, un, and there's not a lot of clarity around this, of what happens to their dependents and descendants? And nobody quite knows how that money, how much they could get, if any, and how it would be allocated. Um, so you can understand the, 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 the kind of, yes, it, it's good that they finally agreed to pay compensation, but there's also an awful lot of anger and frustration that they've dragged their feet and that the amount they get um, is not entirely certain. Yeah. Now, what do you think about this, everybody? Have you been involved in the infected blood scandal? What do you think should be done about compensation to do it? I think what's going to happen is the government's going to set up a big sort of panel and argue about some of the detail, how mm. it does this. And it's going to talk to some of the campaigners and campaign groups to get them involved. But one of the campaigns, Factor 8, was saying yesterday, their response to this was that it was a gut punch. Mm government's announcement because the interim payments of about I think 200 grand so or 100 grand so far have gone out to people they were the ones with the simple easy cases so like you know someone who died as an adult with a partner who they're married to and children who have legal case legal executors legal estates and everything they got an interim payment and now they're getting another interim payment of about 200 grand so those few simple easy cases are getting 300 grand but there are people with complex, perhaps much more morally and financially necessary cases who've got nothing. And so you're getting this possibility now, this 2.7 million, the payout, that would be for someone who is still alive and who has both hep C and HIV. Now, the chances of you still being alive decades after that with those two are probably pretty slim. Um, bereaved partners, siblings, children get less anyway. There's more of them than there are the initial victims. And if you died without a legal estate, i.e. you were a kid, you died under the age of 18. We've reported on cases like this in the mirror, Jason, haven't we? There is the parents don't that there is no legal estate. You don't have a right to compensation for the death of a child. It's astonishing so far. One story we featured um, a week or so ago was a lady infected with HIV by her partner, who so far hasn't qualified for any power either because he's died. And if he was still alive, he would have qualified. She would have qualified for power of being infected by him. It's a complete mess, isn't it, Jason? Predictably, is there any way? Because it is complex. There are lots of different stories and and needs in it is there any way to actually smooth that out and make it simpler and just say look if you were given infected blood you get bang that's it well i mean, I mean you you could kind of do a kind of kind of a, a kind of policy of everybody gets a certain amount but then you can see how that could create kind of 
the tensions of some people say, look, my life was much worse affected than this by yeah. others. And, and um, you can see that where that lies. Um, the, there is, I mean, the, there is this also issue, you know, but, you know, the, the, the trauma these people have suffered of, you know, having to live with, with a chronic and debilitating disease in, in, in many cases. And the, how that's impacted on their personal life, their family life. You know, there's a very good column by by Polly Hudson in the Mirror today, talking to to, to the partner of of, of of one of the victims who died just five weeks ago. And it's you know that her whole life was was you know transformed by by this injustice. And you know she's one of the people saying that you know this money should have been paid earlier. Uh, and, but also it gives this kind of human aspect to it of, of like how difficult it and how traumatic this whole experience is being. And, and, you know, then you have to end up squabbling with a, an official over whether you get kind of, you know, £90,000 or £110,000. That's just kind of adds insult to injury, doesn't it? Yeah. And it does feel more like, you know, that, that they're trying to quibble about how much they pay the bill in mm. total that, you know, mm. this they're trying to minimize it for people mm. and that is the overall arching idea not what how much do you need here mm. it is to tailored for your needs it's how much can we get away with paying you how much do we not have to pay you and it's that it's that attitude i think and perhaps that impression which is not going to help the situation um but what do you think everybody uh do you think they should be giving a flat payment or do you think it should be tailored for people and their their different illnesses and different needs it does seem a bit fair to some extent mm. but elsewhere on that page there's a couple of other points that i think we need to quickly discuss lord clark the former health secretary under margaret thatcher who who was there for, um you know in charge during a lot of the period when this infected blood was still being given to people, even though there were warnings being raised about it. He gave some shocking evidence to the inquiry. He didn't know why he was there. He had nothing to do with it. He was quite scathing. He seemed to care very, very little about what was going on. He's, he's facing calls now to be stripped of his peerage, but Ken Clark is a fairly well-beloved figure normally. Isn't he? <laughs> um, he seems sort of like a, you know, to, to those of us who can remember him from, from the 80s, he seems like a bumbling jazz fan and uh, not fairly harmless, but obviously not quite how it came across. Well, the interestingly, <laughs> Susie, but, but, but you're, you're obviously too young. There was a time in the 1980s when Ken Clark was the most unpopular politician in the whole of Britain, um, uh, he, basically because he tried to dock nurses' pay. Um, yeah. And, and of, of all the people of the Thatcher government, and there was quite a lot of competition to be unpopular in that government. He, he was the one who, who people hated the most. And then he kind of reinvented himself as this kind of, you know, kind of like cigar smoking, kind of, as you said, jazz fan, hush puppy mm. wearing, kind of cuddly Ken. I, I always thought that was a little bit of a kind of um, an act. A kind of superficial. Well, he's got to touch the Boris Johnsons about him, isn't he? And yeah, that's... I mean, because you know, he, you know, because he made he could tell a decent joke, and he was kind of quite funny. Oh, but actually, he's a fairly hard nosed Tory. I mean, when he came back, he was brought back by David Cameron as Justice Secretary. I mean, if you've got a, a crisis in our prisons now, where the police have been told not to arrest people because there aren't enough spaces in our cells, go back and blame Ken Clark. He was a guy who cut the budget for justice caused all the chaos in the courts. Yeah. Yeah. And he seems to somehow get away with it. When he loses peerage, very much doubt it, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> if Jeffrey Archer's still sitting there, yeah. then everybody's going to still sit there. Hmm. Steve says it's great that people be compensated, but once they've been paid out, will the UK be able to afford to compensate all the other scandals, such as the nuclear test veterans, Grenfell, etc.? There's a long list of campaigns under the banner of the Hillsborough Law Now Group for orders of restitution. For those who don't know, Steve is the son of a nuclear test veteran. He's featured in the mirror a lot. He's also part of the Hillsborough Law campaign which has been trying to ensure that laws are passed, basically, which ensure these kinds of scandals, Orgreave, Grenfell, Windrush, that they just don't keep happening like this. And the nuclear test veterans is the first of that lot, right? It was predates everything else. And that's what's mentioned, actually, in the bottom corner of that page, the right-hand corner, Andy Burnham's talking about all those other scandals and predicting that nuclear test veterans are going to be the next big problem for the government to have to deal with, down on the bottom right-hand side of the page there. Now, Rishi Sunak promised systemic change at the dispatch box yesterday. He said this must never happen again, and it really mustn't happen again. But... No one got to ask him any questions about that, Jason, and his government's repeatedly blocked the legislation that would that would make that happen, isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, he, 
I mean, Sunak said, you know, you, you, we, we kind of must end this this uh, process, which we're seeing repeatedly of inquiries where, 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 where victims' voices go, go, go unheard and, and it takes so long for them to get any form of justice. Now, there's two ways you, which are basically come from the Hillsborough, which you could actually try and change that. One is what you mentioned in your article, which is this so-called Hillsborough law, which is about duty of candor. So um, at a public inquiry, civil servants, officials, etc., have by law to speak the truth. I know it sounds slightly weird. You have to do that in court, but you don't necessarily have to do it in a public inquiry. Yeah. And that would put that on the statute book. Um, that's been introduced to Parliament at least twice now, and both times it has been rejected by the government. The other law, which has also come from Hillsborough, is the Advocacy Act, um, well, not Act, Bill, which has been championed by Marie Eagle. She's um, raised this 12 times now as a private member's bill. This would give uh, victims of a miscarriage of justice, whether it's Hillsborough or Grenfell or um, contaminated blood, um, it would give them legal representation, which mm. means they'd be more easily able to fight their case. Now, again, the government could find time for that any time it wants. If, you know, these bills, if they, it's in the government's gift to decide whether they proceed or not, and it has failed to do so. So at one point, you've got Rishi Sunak going, look, this is terrible. We've had these kind of <laughs> these people whose voices are going unheard. And yet his own government is in a position to actually try and rectify this. And is is effectively by not doing so and not finding the time for it, especially at a time when it's got to be said, Parliament is rising early. It's not doing a lot of work. Mm. It's not having a lot of debates. It's they're struggling to find things to fill up the parliamentary timetable with. I mean, the speakers are taking every urgent question that gets gets asked for because they've got nothing else to do all day. Mm. And by not letting those things go in the statute books or even discussing them, then you are effectively mm. silencing those people. Mike says there seems to be a theme in recent months with the infected blood scandal, nuclear veterans and the post office that those in power simply don't think people worst affected should have any say or any cooperation until it's dragged out of them. Oh, Mike. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. A thousand times yes. But ah. Hopefully it's the dog days of that kind of attitude and it's going to change if there's a general election. But who knows? Once the institutional defensiveness, which Brian Lagstaff talked about, Lagstaff talked about with the infected blood inquiry, once that gets transferred to a new party of, of government, is it going to change? You know, that, that idea that Whitehall just doesn't have to doesn't have to do anything unless it's forced to. I don't know that Keir Starmer is going to be any more able to deal with that than anyone else has been. Um, Steve says you have to avoid taxpayer funding compensation being used as a substitute for actual accountability. Yes, Steve, but as many campaigners have pointed out to me over the years, the, they don't really care about the money. It doesn't make much difference if you've got hep C and HIV. Sod it. What do the millions matter? But it means if they've got to pay out, it means they care. It's as simple as that. And they have to start budgeting for it and they have to start acknowledging you. And that's the it's a it's a key to unlock lots of other things. Now, on to the main story of the day. And this morning, post office but former post office boss Paula Venels, who presided over the scandal of wrongful convictions of thousands of sub postmasters for fraud, when it was actually the Horizon computer system which was wrongly totting up the day's takings, she's due to give evidence uh, for three days at the post office inquiry and it's going to be box office stuff isn't it jason i mean thanks to mr Bates versus the post office she's probably the most unpopular woman in britain isn't she she's taken over from ken clark i think yeah <laughs> she's uh, um, a cigar. maybe that's going to be her move today uh, but, but i mean it, apart from her being kind of doorstepped a couple of times outside of church she's an anglican priest isn't she which is kind of you know kind of uh, mm adds to the kind of the, some of the kind of mystery about her behavior. We haven't really heard her speak. and We've never heard her speak at length. She's put out a kind of kind of statement, which is a slightly mealy mouth statement of, of, of regret um, and said she's not saying anymore until this moment, this morning, when she'll actually give evidence. So we this is the first time we've actually heard her properly being held to, a, to account for what happened. Now, the obvious question, is when did she first find out that there were problems of this horizon system? Mm. Um, we, we, she's never come clean on that yet, so we, we need to know that. And then we need to know is when did she did find out, what did she do about it? Did she then continue 
to pursue the sub postmasters and postmistresses through the courts in the knowledge um, that, she, that the system was flawed or not. We don't know the answer to that. It may she may have a a, a perfectly clear defence. I, I um, but you know she didn't know. Um, and then there's a, a probably a, a equally serious is the question of whether she misled MPs when she appeared before them in 2015. Um, because she told them then that she was unaware of any problems with Horizon. There's subsequent mm. emails and various other information has come to light, but that seems to be inaccurate. I mean, I say seems. It, it, you know, these things are very contested and she may be innocent. I'm saying that for our lawyers, Susie. <laughs> yes. um, we don't know until she's up, do we? What she's going to yeah, her but, but those are the three kind of main areas. But I, but an awful lot of this would be about the about her demeanour and about how she comes across. I, I mean, there is kind of like, as I said, there's kind of there's this kind of disconnect between somebody who, on the face of it, has. Um, acted with with kind of extremely punitively towards towards employees who at the same time you know lead services or led services in, in church and you kind of like you know will what will we see we will we see a, a kind of hard-headed businesswoman we will see somebody who's contrite we, we don't know and I'm, i think the, the, the drama is going to be as intriguing as anything yeah and it is a bit of a conflict there isn't there because She's a priest on the one hand and a hard-headed mm. businesswoman on the other. Mm. She um, was the head of the, the organisation and therefore bears ultimate responsibility mm. on the one hand. But yet on the other, is not the person necessarily. She wasn't conducting the interviews that were bullying postmasters. She wasn't, um, you know, she wasn't going around there and trying to offer them bribes. She wasn't doing some of the worst things that we saw in the Mr Bates drama. Um mm. And she does seem to have tried to talk to some of the MPs and answer the questions. Maybe, maybe somehow, although, you know, she was so at the top of the organisation, she knew very little about what was going on further down. That's the kind of thing they're going to be discussing, isn't it? But so, I mean, it's hard to know what she's going to say. We can have a, a stab at the kind of thing she's she's going to be asked. And the, the inquiry's already seen evidence of emails from Paula Venels, and which we actually, I think they were mentioned, it was mentioned in the ITV drama as well, who wanted to say to Parliament when she gave evidence 2015 mm -hmm. that the Horizon system couldn't be remotely accessed. Ergo, that therefore the only people, that the postmasters must have been on the fiddle because no one else could get in there. Mm -hmm. And we all now know that Horizon could be remotely accessed and they were remotely accessing it at Fujitsu. Um, that kind of thing is going to be the most difficult for her to answer, isn't it? Because the whole world's seen it played out in a drama and it's there in an email. I mm. want to say that we can't get into Horizon. Is that right? Or what, you know, can I say this? And she's being given the, the lawyer's answer somehow from inside the organisation as to what to say. And she's going to be claiming, well, I'm just saying what I, I asked the question and I'm, I'm, I said what I was told to say. Um, and she's going to be sort of shifting blame a bit, maybe, onto the people who were beneath her and not telling her the full truth. I don't think that would necessarily wash. I think, you know, there is, as you say, there's an accountability issue here. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was, she was, you know, she was in charge of this organisation for seven years. It's a long time. Um, and, you, you you know, part of the responsibility with, 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 with running a large organisation like that, which is very handsomely rewarded, it is to actually make sure that, you know, what you know what's going on within that organization. I think mm -hmm. kind of I think she's going to find it difficult to say I was kept in the dark. <laughs> I don't think that yeah. was. Because it, it, that that's, that's, true that's, or that's, not. I still think it's going to be a difficult thing to Yeah, but know. that is exactly what we saw at the infected mm. blood inquiry as well. It's yeah. exactly what we hear um you know but Andy Burnham's own evidence to the inquiry mm -hmm. when he was health minister was like the officials were not telling me the truth. Mm -hmm. And he had to go and dig and find out. And that's what um, Brian Langstaff found in his report was mm. that ministers and civil servants were not invested. They weren't asking the right questions. Mm. They were just going, can I say that? Okay, fine. And doing and doing the easy thing rather than everything else. Now, um, what do you think Paula Venel should be asked everybody? What would you like to ask her? If you saw Mr. Bates and you were there at the inquiry today. What would you like to ask Paula Venel? Get into the comments and let us know. Rose says she's going to count up how many times I can't okay. remember, I can't recall. I, I think Rose makes a very good point that Paula Bennells is going to be uh, kind of lawyered up and there's going to be, um, that's not my recollection, or mm. as far as I recall, 
to the best of my knowledge. Yeah, yeah. yeah so we're going to hear a lot of those sort of phrases. Yeah, well, don't, don't have a drinking, don't have <laughs> and, a drinking game on those, Rose. And, and if you're a, a sub postmaster or sub postmistress, you're going to be throwing things at your TV screen throughout this. Yeah, yeah this is <laughs> this is the thing, isn't it? Because after that ITV drama, Paula Venels mm. is the head that everyone wanted to see on a stick. Really, mm. um, Jay says I agree. There's someone at the top. I don't think she's ever going to tell the truth. But you know, she was in charge. She insisted there was nothing wrong. Did she really believe that? Did she really believe that a thousand or more sub postmasters, all of whom had passed character tests, that was one of the things, it's not just like you or I getting a job, okay? You had to pass the character assessment to get a postmaster's job. That Thanks. Well, they don't have that in journalism, Susie. Well, no, 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 there wouldn't be a journalism left, would there? But the, 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 all those people were suddenly on the rob, and one of them is featured in the paper today, an ex-policeman, called Peter Holmes, whose widow Marion says his life was destroyed by the false allegations that he stole £46,000. Now, even though there was he was an ex-copper, even though there was no trace of him acquiring or spending that kind of money, the post office took him to court and facing a jail term as a former policeman, he accepted a plea deal in order to avoid jail quite reasonably. He pled guilty and accepted a suspended sentence. But the publicity, the headlines about a bent former copper on the take, it destroyed him, Marion says. He died of a brain tumour in 2015 before he could get that conviction overturned. And Marion's going to be at the inquiry today, I think, or if not watching online, and she's going to be staring Paula Venels right in the eye, isn't she? And it's it's her verdict that matters perhaps more than anybody else's. Yeah, precisely. It's the, 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 it's the people who are going to be watching, who are going to be at the inquiry, and they're going to be interviewed afterwards and go, well, what did you think about what Paula Venables had to say to you? Which is, a, you know, again, as we've seen with the infected blood inquiry, it's the talking to the victims go, well, how do you feel about the compensation? It's not good enough for the government or for someone else to just say something anymore. Once the scandal gets too big and it's out of control, it becomes up to the victims, which is where the nuclear veterans need to be. Um, KN, probably not the real name, says it's amazing all the directors and lawyers involved in the post office scandal all suffer from selective amnesia when evidence is found against them. They're either lying or it's not. It's not an act. Um, the question, I suppose, is whether what we're going to get out of poor today has any value. You know, it's a real apology and explanation or it's a lawyer's one, as you suggested, Jace, that, you know, whether the families get a sense of justice and relief or whether they just get angrier and start hurling stuff at the telly, like you said. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be the, the judgment, what they say when she steps down from the witness stand on Friday afternoon. And then we have to wait for that, I think, through several days of um, testimony before we get to that point. Steve says maybe the question that should be asked is, could she have done more? <laughs> yes, is the answer. Not <laughs> even a question. That was Steve. That's just a flat fact. We don't need to question that at all. Um, so we'll have to wait and see, I suppose. But when you have, I suppose, what we're talking about for the news stories of the week, you know, what matters for the compensation deal and everything is really how the victims respond to it and what will happen with Paula Venels, whatever we hear in the witness box over the next couple of days is going to be what's said when she's finished by people like Marion, um, who our sympathies have to be with. Right. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Now, we have managed to find some good news in the world for you. And here it is. Now, there's always an awful lot made, of course, about heroes of the Second World War uh, who are getting a bit thin on the ground these days. But there are two featured on page 29 of the paper today who have amazing and fairly unheard stories. Now, the main story there is about Norman Parker, who has a 14 year old schoolboy with a bunch of other lads and local housewives secretly built whole squadrons of Spitfires as part of the war effort in Wiltshire barns and outhouses, doing it all secretly and on their own, and then bringing it together to put them, to build them together only at the end, in order to confuse the German spies and so on, who are trying to destroy the, the, cap the manufacturing capabilities of the RAF. They did it all secretly. He's unfortunately passed away, which is why he's in the paper, but he did help bring all that unsung heroism to light before he died. And on the left of that page, still with us, fortunately, is John Dennett, who never landed at D-Day, but was in the channel on a landing ship throughout, uh, ferrying the wounded back to Britain as the battle raged. And you saw it all firsthand. And there's one quote in there, Jason, which really struck me in John's story. He said, it's only in later years when I've sat down and realised all the years of freedom. Sorry, I'm going to fill up a little bit because it's quite emotional. All the years of freedom I've enjoyed, and I've enjoyed a lot wouldn't have been here if we hadn't fought. So Jason, I suppose, is this proof that if something's really worth fighting for, whether it's 
truth, justice, freedom, accountability, anything else. Everybody benefits from those fights in the end. Oh, yeah. I mean, we should be incredibly grateful to this generation. You know, we kind of, um, the, the kind of, the, the, the legacy, what they call the great peace has been extraordinary. And, and kind of, uh, and it kind of, you know, I, I think there's always a danger you take these things for granted. I don't think we kind of realise how lucky we are. We've gone through such a, a long protracted spell. Or, or, I mean, there are conflicts, obviously, and there's conflicts in, in, in mainland Europe, but, 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 but compared with what preceded this, it's, you know, it's, it's exceptional. So we should be very grateful. And yeah. they were so young. You know, this guy was, you know, John Denny, he, was, he, was, he, 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 he lied about his age so he could list to serve in the Navy. Yeah? Yeah. And, My uh, granddad was in the channel at, at D-Day as well. Also didn't land at D-Day a bit after, but he was in his 30s. He was a furniture salesman, conscripted, called up, mm. told to go and sort out Adolf. Didn't want to. Mm. Never went back to France. <laughs> went there once. It was crap. Never going back again. And um, that's the other thing, Susie. This is really important. But I mean, I remember kind of like the last First World War soldier dying. Mm. I think he, was, he got to something like 114. It was quite extraordinary. And we're, only a, we're getting to that stage now. There's only a few few left mm. serving veterans. There's not many left. And we should, you know, treasure our memories while we've got them because, you know, that, that kind of that bit of living history is really very precious. Yeah, and I suspect when the last one's gone, that kind of attitude that John Dennett's got mm. there, uh, appreciating mm. the peace that came since, is probably going mm. to start fading with him as well. And it's one of the things mm. that the nuclear veterans helped create, because with the nuclear deterrent, no one's come to pick a fight with us. Yeah. Since. So that's worth mm. bearing in mind, especially when that scandal uh, blows up as it's going to fairly soon. Yeah. So if you're watching yeah. right um thank you jason for all of that thank you everyone for taking part uh, if you're listening on podcast please leave us a review so other people can find us share this on your facebook pages so other people can see the wonderful things that you've enjoyed uh, we are now going to take i'm afraid two weeks off um and we'll be back on june the 10th after uh, a brief half-term hiatus and some building work, which makes this kind of thing far too difficult. And until then, everybody, uh, stay safe, take care. We'll see you on the other side. Tatty, bye.